All right, what is up, my peeps? Joshua Smith here with another GSD Mode podcast weekly interview. Where every single week, I interview straight up top badasses out there dominating their space, top business owners, top real estate professionals, and again, just overall top badasses out there doing big, amazing, epic things in their lives. Today, guys, we got another amazing podcast guest here on the show. So, just to give a, a little bit of context before we jump in here, so he's a top three team leader in the state of New Mexico. Currently doing over 110 million annually with his real estate team. He's personally sold over 300 million dollars of real estate. So really stoked and honored to have Stefan Walters on the podcast. Welcome to the podcast, brother. Thanks for having me, man. Been looking forward to it for a while. Yeah, yeah, me too, dude. Me too, man. So um, before we get into all the epic shit that you're doing now and and continuing to do, I'm always intrigued in our guest journeys that led him here into real estate in the first place. So rewind the clocks. Like, what did you do before real estate? And what ultimately led you to jumping into this, this insane career? So, yeah, you're right. It is an insane career. And anyone who gets into it has to be a little insane as well, I feel like. Or they may not understand, but once they get into it, they realize, you know, you're a little bit crazy to keep going in this career path. So, you know, I'll be totally raw. You know, when I graduated college and I said, great, you know, I got my degree. Now I can go get a $100,000 job, you know, that pays me a hundred grand a year. I'll sit back, rely, or relax and have like a nine to five. I ended up getting a DWI shortly after and I was serving tables, you know, so like this is right when I'm graduating, I got my degree. So a lot of these sales positions that I was going to apply for, they required me to go and have a clear license so I could drive their cars, right? You know, because they couldn't insure me because I had freaking DWI, um, which that was a t terrible mistake, but you know, we're young. So basically... It was either, hey, we need you to have more sales experience or, hey, we're going to have you drive these cars to go, you know, and sale on our behalf. But we can't insure you because, you know, you have a freaking interlock in your car. So um, long story short, my dad had been in real estate for the longest time. You know, he was kind of a little bit out on his way out of the business. And I'm thinking, well, I've always been interested to do it. And I need sales experience. So, you know, what better way to hop into real estate, get my license, kind of at least get the experience. And then I can go and work other jobs and have like past experience, right? So um, immediately once I got into real estate and realized, well, this is like unlimited income opportunity. You know, I don't think I really need to go and get sales experience and, and try and get another job because then I'm going to be working a nine to five. I have to do everything else, you know, like per their per their book, exactly how they want me to do it. Right now, I have the opportunity to go and prospect, go and get my own clients, be my own boss, right? I mean, that's, I think that's the funniest part too, right? Because at first I thought, you know, I'm going to be my own boss. Really, our clients are kind of all our bosses. Um, you know, if someone needs to be, to go see a home or transact, it's kind of like speed to lead. So, but I was okay with that. You know, I'm okay with hustling. That's kind of what I did, you know, before while I was in, in college. So I didn't need that strict nine to five timeline. I was okay with, pretty much doing whatever I had to do on weekends. Um, so that's kind of how I got started into it. But right when I got started in real estate, I realized, I mean, this isn't as easy as everyone paints the picture for it to be, right? And I don't even think really anyone actually paints that picture, but that's what like the general public paints it as. Like, hey, this is, you just get your real estate license. You take a headshot, you go out there and you start selling homes. You know, no, it's not, not, not that way. So actually- I have to give you props because you're one of my first coaches. Like I was telling you before, I was in boot camp number 20, like 90 day boot camp. So, um, and the reason why I did that, because I was a solo agent, right? So when I joined, I didn't join a team. I didn't join, you know, a big brokerage like Keller Williams or one of those that had a lot of training. Um, you know, I joined a flat fee brokerage because I thought I need to keep all my money as possible, as much money as possible, which, you know, actually did me good. But at the same time, I wasn't around like a lot of top producers who were, doing certain things that got me to that level. So I said, Hey, I saw one of your ads a long time ago. I mean, this is freaking 2016 or 17, right? Saw one of your ads, joined your classes. I mean, your boot camp is, is crazy, right? It's, I mean, it's something that you say, it's like drinking out of a, a fire hydrant, right? Like it's, it's almost information overload. So, but I was able to pick a bunch of different things from that and um, basically start lead generating, start, um, prospecting in different ways, whether that was free or with ad spend. And yeah, here we are years later. I mean, I'm doing about 95 deals each year by myself. My team, we're doing about 280 plus just depends, you know, how the, how the year goes. So yeah, that's kind of my journey, kind of how I started. And, um, you know, that's, that's where we are now. 
Yeah, love it, dude. Okay, so that, that first year, you know, you jump in. And, and and the reason why I like to break down that that first initial phase before the team started is we all know the failure rate in this industry. You know, what's it, 90% oh, yeah. dropout between year three and five. And so many have difficult time getting that right momentum in the beginning. So yep. you mentioned, okay, you know, whether it be prospecting free or paid, I mean, you just, you got busy and you got at it. Out of the gate, what were those initial immediate things that you learned work for you to start putting those first deals together so you could have a successful first few years and didn't become a statistic like so many become? Well, my first year and a half was terrible, right? Like this is the, that's the year that most agents would have that they would never come back. They would never end up doing real estate full time. Like there was plenty of people who joined with me at the exact same time that sold like 15 deals their first year. And I'm like, dude, I suck. Like what's going on, you know? But I was also like 24, 25. So I didn't know a whole lot of first time home buyers or people who were moving into like, you know, moving into houses. So you know, I just said, well, what can I do to go get more business? Right. And so really creating a personal brand was like number one, that was my number one thing. And that's the thing that I, I, I even teach my team. And I still praise to this day, you know, before I even became, you, you kind of have to plant the seeds of like who you are or who you're going to become before you even become that person. So of course, you know, when I'm not selling any homes is my first two years in real estate. Like I don't have much to post, but let's say if I'm going out there and I'm doing an open house or I'm showing a home or I'm doing something like that, like I got comfortable getting on camera and being like, Hey, what's going on? Check out this, this super cool view showing homes today, making that personal brand online to where people start to see you. Because I mean, like, dude, we have our freaking phone, like everyone spends all this money on marketing, but we have our phones that reaches thousands of people a day. And that's on the very minimum if we just put ourselves out there. So number one, that was one of the most things that I did was just work on creating a personal brand. Um, Cause you know, I wasn't like, I do a lot of inbound lead generation rather than outbound. Like I, I'm not like a big cold caller or any, any type of that. Um, we would do plenty of door knocking and certain things like that. But I was like trying to again, create that brand to where I become like the attractive character for people to reach out to me rather than me have to like blow people up because that's just kind of like how I really wanted to do it, right? Um, and then by doing that, it kind of created as much opportunity and it didn't happen overnight. You know, building a personal brand, everyone wants things to happen instantly. And so it was all about like the delayed gratification. Like, hey, I'm going to work on building my personal brand right now. Like obviously tomorrow, I'm not going to be that real estate guy, but set six, seven years later, everyone knows me as the real estate guy. And I don't even really think about it at times. You know, I just go to showings. Oh, hey, check out this super cool view. Oh, this is a badass house. Check it out. Just sold. You have to do it with like a little bit of flair, right? You can't just be like constantly just sold or real boring and, you know, like real Manila. You have to kind of put some edge to it. But it, I did it to the point and maybe even subconsciously to where now people come up to me when I see them, they're like, Oh, how's real estate, this, this, and that to where it almost, it's sometimes annoying. Cause they almost just identify then identify me as the real estate guy rather than just like, Hey, you're just a regular person, but that's fine because that's how I drive in my business. That's who I've become. That's who I wanted to create. And that's, you know, now who I am. So. Yeah. No, I love that dude. So in, 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 you know, you said something that was key. There's like, and these aren't your exact words, but like, this is a long game thing. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and, and I mean, everybody today expects instant gratification. We're in the Amazon world. Everybody wants six, you know, six minute abs or whatever, which doesn't exist, yep. but, um, you know, but, but how do you, how do you get your agents that you work with to play the long game with something like building that personal brand in that way that can pay off massively in the future, but we're not seeing that immediate payoff. Yeah. Setting expectations, right? The setting expectations part is the most important thing because if I let them know, look, I've been doing this for eight or nine years now, you know, it'll actually eight. So this year will be eight. I've been posting constantly. I've been calling people. I've had tons of fails, failures. Like this doesn't happen overnight. And then when I tell them like, look, start posting, start doing this type of stuff. And then once they do, sometimes they, they do see instant results. Like I'll, I'll do one-on-one -on -one coachings with some of my, um, you know, agents on my team who want to, it's all about being coachable too, right? Like some of my team members are, are a little bit more coachable than others at times. And you know, they're all, I'd say very coachable, but some like really want a little bit more. Um, and if they're open to listening to it and then listening to, Hey, these are the expectations. It's not going to happen overnight. 
but then they start to post and then they get good reactions from it. They realize, oh, wow, like I'm already getting good responses or like I already had someone reaching out to me. Because again, I'd say like mine didn't happen even close to overnight. There's some people who get on social media and they have people reaching out to them right away and I love it. And, but that didn't happen to me. So I think I've been forced to have like the delayed gratification rather than where some people, if I teach them exactly what I'm doing and tell them what I'm doing and how to do it, they start doing it and they have a little bit of success right away. At least they can start to see what's going to be happening in the future. Um, so really just setting the expectations. It's not going to happen immediately, but if you consistently do it on a daily basis, it's going to you know turn out how you want it. Yep. Yep. hundred percent. Okay. So, you know, you said something earlier on there of, you know, okay. And, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounded like, like you mentioned door knocking. So it sounded like, okay, like you, you understood the importance of building your brand. You also mm -hmm. had clarity on, okay, down the road, I want to build an inbound style business. Yeah. But then knowing that, Hey, look to get immediate now business, I might have to do some prospecting based stuff like door knocking, knowing that that's not forever. Yeah. Eventually this stuff builds up. Um, you know, um, so then at what point in your career did it get to the point where you could personally drop like the prospecting based stuff where then you had enough inbound stuff coming in? Well, we still, I still have a massive ad spend each, each month. You know, there are certain things that I still, well, and that's the thing, like inbound marketing isn't only just from like my personal brand. It's also from certain things that we pay for, even just like the, the Z word that most agents don't like to hear, you know, but we, it's, you know, Zillow has really good live connections. It's a really expensive ad platform, but they're higher quality. So we still have a big ad spend. So it's not like everything is inbound organically, but that's still an inbound lead. Right. So, but again, before, like when I didn't have an ad budget, um, because I do a combo of both and I didn't really even realize like what I was creating was going to even give me inbound organic referrals and stuff. Cause a lot of my business comes in inbound from an agent in Arizona, an agent in Colorado that has someone moving in and they search up, you know, my name or they don't, they don't search my name. They search up, Hey, realtors in New Mexico, realtors in Albuquerque. And all of a sudden I have 200 plus almost 300 reviews. So that, that kind of helps me a lot more too. But so at the beginning, I had no clue. I was really creating like an inbound um, marketing machine, which is really cool. But I was just focusing on like, you have to go put in the work. You have to go create as much opportunity for yourself as possible. And by doing that, I had to pick one of the lead gen strategies that I was okay with doing as much as possible. So I was fine with doing open houses, right? And again, I took your boot camp. that, you know, do, hold, holding a mega open house is probably the most, the best thing you could potentially do, especially get now business and future business, um, farming an area. I think farming an area is a little bit harder because sometimes, you know, the ideal to farm an area is to have your signs in one area and consistently do those open houses over and over and over again. It was hard to find like consistent listings within the brokerage. And we had 800 brokers over there to do the same exact amount of open houses there, but we still did mega open houses everywhere. So again, creating as much opportunity as possible by picking one of the lead gen strategies that you're okay with doing. So whether that is open houses, if you're a cold caller, you know, if you are willing to door knock, I paired door knocking with open houses. So again, you're basically kind of like, um, you know, doing the, that whole flyer thing that you, you would talk about. We go pick, get a flyer, print it out, say, hey, we're inviting you to our open house. So a combo of door knocking, open houses, until we really just started to pick up a lot of traction and get enough buyers to where then I'm like, hey, I have enough money for an ad spend. Now, how much can I put in for ad spend? And then again, really the dominoes just kind of start to fall. So it really isn't like you want to be building your personal brand and hoping for that inbound marketing, but at the same time, you cannot rely on it. And the people who just rely on one thing, it's going to be a little hairy, right? So, I mean, obviously you don't want to try every single thing possible and be cold calling, door knocking, you know, mailers, everything, because you're going to get a little like scatterbrain. But if you pair it together with, again, maybe like, G, you know, um, circle prospecting, cold calling with intention for your open house, then that's going to get you some good results. But if you're doing everything under the sun and half-assing it all, you're not going to really get the, the, the level of success you're looking for. So if you pick one or two, combine them together to have the best success you possibly can, then you're going to have to, then you're going to start having the closings you're looking for, but it's also in the follow-up too, right? You know, this is all stuff I'm preaching to the choir right now, but um, yeah, that's kind of how it all, all panned out really.
creating as much opportunity as I possibly could by picking one or two lead gen sources, pairing them together and just going freaking all out, you know, and, and really having no other option. Like that's just what I was doing. You know, I wanted to succeed in real estate. I wanted to see it happen. Um, and there was only really one way by getting out there and doing the work. Yep. Yep. So you're, you're, you're not just taking massive action, but you're being very strategic with it. <clears throat> um, as yeah. you mentioned, and then, okay. So that starts to accelerate growth. At what point did you know that you were ready to start your real estate team? Well, and that's, so that's a great question. I really like that you asked that because I feel like so many people, you know, trying to start a team before they have the excess opportunity or before they're even ready. Right. So the number one thing in starting a team is to have op opportunity for either coaching to basically train and lead them or opportunity with existing lead flow so that you can actually help them grow their own business by provide providing like overflow lead flow. So I see a lot of people that are in their second or third year in business think that they need to go build a team because that's the next best thing. And they, and they, I didn't do this with this intention, but a lot of other people build a team because they think that they can make money off the team. Right. It's, it's, um, it's a good idea. It's a good thought in their mind. Like, Oh, well I could go give business to people or I could get them on my team. I can get like overflow income from them closing deals. That's not how I even had it, had a look at all. Basically, I thought like once I got to a specific level to where I had um, a value proposition to where I could train them because again, I know my craft like very well and I probably got, I probably waited until I was even more comfortable than I needed to be to create a team, but I wanted to make sure I had a correct value proposition with it, which is either again, providing value with training and coaching to where you can like lead them to success or you have opportunity for leads so that they could actually, you know, pick it up and take the overflow business. And because when you're a brand new agent, right, you don't have a whole lot of business. And this is maybe why when I was a brand new agent, if I had joined a team, maybe it would have helped me a little bit better. But I think like I'm doing pretty good with how it turned out. So I don't know, maybe my own path was just how I needed it to be. But for the most part, there's 90% 90, 90 failure rate. Because why? Because people either don't have the correct training, or they don't have the right opportunity. So once you have either opportunity to train or opportunity for for lead flow, that's when it's the time to create a team, right? Like a lot of people try and put the cart before the horse. And then what happens is they might get five or six people on their team. And then the team starts getting disappointed. Hey, well, none of these promises are fulfilled. Like you were saying they were, you said you were going to be able to give me leads. I thought this was going to have all this great training, but I mean, if you're in the business two or three years, like there's some, there's some outliers that are really good, right. And know their craft. And most of them usually have a little bit of background and other sales avenues, but like, you're not going to be the best realtor within the first three years, unless you also put in like hours and hours and hours of time. So, um, yeah, I really just wanted to make sure that I thought I was personally ready to be able to provide for a team with value, uh, before I actually started the team. So, yep. And then what, what year was this? Like 20. So my company's called New Mexico home group. Um, that I created it to again, make it something to where it wasn't like, Hey, join Stefan Walters realty team, because that's not something like everyone can kind of get behind. Right. But New Mexico home group, it's kind of like a broad hyper local vision type company to where it's like, yeah, I, I can get behind that. That's a brand that everyone can support and everyone local can kind of like rep. So I created that in 2019. Um, I actually got my girlfriend into the business like three or three years after I got in. So it was basically me and her just like, crushing it. You know, we would go do open houses. We would basically do everything. And she heard me talking on the phone and everything else for three or four years straight. So she picked it up really quick. So that was my first person who I really trained. And she, I mean, was up and running. Then what happened is we basically started, uh, we, we were forced to actually get a TC one time because, and this is actually in a good thing, right? Like how to really scale and take it to the next level. You need to create leverage right through systems and processes and have someone else helping you but i was too cheap to freaking let go of five six hundred bucks a transaction um but we were going out of town we we're going out to lake powell there's no service i had to find someone that could help me basically take over all my deals at the time i had like 12 deals running so i was like hey we need to find someone that can show for us take our deals we left we came back everything was okay and um, I realized, wow, like this is, this actually could work. I never want to touch my freaking transactional paperwork and stuff like that again. So I asked her if she wanted to be a full-time TC. Long story short, she, you know, ended up working with us and doing like 
300 deals, I think between me and Tess over the course of like, you know, two and a half years or so. And that was also including her. And then at that point I realized, okay, cool. I think now like, you know, I've trained Tess, my girlfriend, she's, she's doing great. Um, Kelsey, who is my, my transaction coordinator, who now I thought was, you know, she was already good to begin with, but again, could now I provide her a little more opportunity to, uh, be more of a buyer's agent. Um, little did I know I was actually shooting myself in the foot cause it's harder to find a good TC than that, you know, works with us like she did. But, um, yeah, so that's kind of how the team evolved. And then I also had people reaching out to me, right? That's the other thing. So not only like, was I creating my personal brand just for like people to reach out to me to buy or sell a home. I had, I have more people reaching out to me to, to join real estate than buy or sell a home, which is the unfortunate part. Right. So at first, you know, I'm like, well, I don't really want to like, you know, I don't really have much to offer. You know, I don't really, what do you want me to just tell you how to get your real estate license and do all this stuff? And I was thinking, well, maybe I want, might as well just like, I can train people. How about I just have them join on as a team? They can come under me and then I can just basically train them. And then we go from there. So that's actually how it happened. I didn't really have this whole vision of like, I need to create a team. I want to make, you know, I want to, you know, create another source of income from a team. It kind of just happened because I had people reaching out to me, asking me to train them and teach them. And then that's really how it, how it started. Um, yeah, I kind of forgot about that. That's kind of really how it started. Yep. Okay. So then what is, what is the team infrastructure look like today? I mean, do you have, you know, like a leads given division in a separate division where it's not leads given, where it is more kind of mentorship, coaching, training? Is there like a combo? Like, what is it, what does it look like today? It depends on the, the skill level of the agent, right? If you're a brand new agent, I mean, you, we have to put you through the mentorship program. So usually like I'm not, you, they'll come on and do a mentorship and do like the first five to seven deals with me or Tess, my partner. And then, um, and right now I'm going to probably be pairing them up with some of the more experienced agents and say, Hey, you guys just do a, a mentorship program. But again, I'm not really trying to add a whole lot more people. So our, how our current structure is, if you're a new agent that comes on and I think you're a good fit, because again, there's a 90% failure rate. And I feel like that's a lot of the times because people don't have the right expectations. So they want to come on. It's not that glorious picture that was painted for them. So they want to leave. So we're real picky about who we have on, you know, we only have about a 12 people total, including myself. And like one or two of those are transaction coordinators, people on the back end. Um, so really it's more of kind of like a team to where I'm just trying to teach them exactly how to be an actual solo agent, but we're on the same team to where they're still generating their self gen business. Um, while also I'm trying to, you know, provide them as much as I possibly can. And then the brokerage I'm with, you know, actually has, um, a B2B referral relationship to where it kind of feeds them some business as well. So, um, yeah, it's more, I don't have like a specific set buyer's agent. I have someone that's go, it's, it's like a showing concierge. That's what I like to call it. Cause I think it sounds a little bit better. So I have a showing concierge transaction coordinator. Um, I handle all my listings still. So again, I'm not like to the point to where I completely like push mine over to a buyer's agent or a specific listing agent. I list all my own homes. That's again, why I'm doing about 95 deals a year. And I still work on my own buyers, but I have a showing concierge helping us, which she's also licensed and still does her own deals. So it's a little bit of a different structure than it, of a team. Um, I am kind of thinking of changing things up a bit to where I'm not like completely involved, like 24 seven, because I mean, as you know, this business gets a little draining. So um, I'm kind of moving some things around right now and actually trying to put together like an in-depth personal team training program to where, because, you know, we have like, um, we have like weekly calls to where we hop on, answer questions, go over different things. But with this market changing so quickly and just like the lack of like knowledge out there, I want to make sure they can go through a program, just like something I went through through yours to where they can learn every single thing. And if they can't find it or think about it, then they either search it up, watch that video, then, then they can bring more topics to the, to the weekly meetings that we can go from there. But um, I think training is like the most important thing possible, right? It truly is like actually, and not only just the deal itself. I mean, that's a whole different animal itself, but how to negotiate certain things, like how to deal with clients, like different types of ways of prospecting, you know, just all the standard stuff you really need to know as an agent to be well-rounded. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny, dude. You know, I find that a, a massive mistake that a lot of team leaders and broker owners make is they get into thinking 
we got to be this revolutionary ahead of the curve, you know? So it's like every week they're training on some new AI concept, some new, I'm like, and especially in a market like this, dude, it's about mastering the damn fundamentals, dude. You just see them confusing yeah. more people than you help, you know? Yep. And, and most people just haven't. And this market's proven that. Yeah. You know, because for 2012 through 2022, like, dude, people didn't really need skill set. Now they yeah. 100% need skill set. And, um, okay, so going back to your own person, because, dude, you're doing 95 units a year. Yeah. Now you have some leverage, you know, but with that, okay, so so it sounds like, okay, you're doing the, you know, the lead gen lead follow-up. Like, okay, you're setting the appointment. You're conducting yeah. the appointment. Yeah. But then from there, you have support, whether it be a showing specialist or a TC, mm -hmm. so then like you get re-involved for the contract negotiation, but then kind of everything else is passed off. Through like kind of I mean, I'm still I'm still involved in basically the whole thing, right? So I know what's going on with inspections and repair requests. Like I'm not always attending every single inspection, right? And every but you know, I'm I'm very deeply involved, and that's one thing that I feel like people fall short of. Like I see other teams here, and this is why I think we've been able to rise to the top three team. You know, and our team is a fraction of the size of these other teams, and they're only doing 30, 40 million more than us. Um, actually deb debatably on one other one of the other teams because they have like a lot of new build listings so it's like are those true sales that's a different story um but let's say you know a lot of these other teams they say hey i want basically you to be the buyer's agent and you go and show them homes once you you know get you find them a home they like now i want you to pass them off to the team we handle it and then you show up for closing they feel like, you know, they're just kind of like a cog in the wheel at that point, the client, right? And they they don't like have that tr that true care and like attention. Because, you know, when we're working with people, we build real close relationships. You know, when we're showing homes with someone, like you build a bond. Um, and that's the same. So even with listings, like I don't, some teams, they say, hey, you know, if you bring in a listing, we have the listing specialist take care of it. And then I feel like, you know, it's kind of a bait and switch. Like, let's say this agent wants to list the home. Um, but then they bring them in cause they're on a team. And then if I forced them to work with me, they might feel like, well, I just got passed off. You know, why didn't I get to work with X agent? And now I have to work with you who I don't have an existing relationship with. And then it feels more transactional rather than like the, the whole creation, the like relationship that you create. So that's how I kind of want to train my team to where they know how to do everything rather than it, it be like, Hey, I'm going to make you send me your listings and I'll give you a, a referral fee or whatever that payout is. I want you to know exactly how to do the listings. I want you to know how to do the buyers so that you guys are all these little mini solo agents on the team and you're basically rocking and rolling. Um, and then they, you know, get higher payouts and standard teams as well. So that's a, again, I, I didn't really like get, since I didn't get on a team to begin with, I'm kind of doing my own creation of a team and how I think I would want to be treated if I was on a team rather than most teams who have a lot of quick turnover because there's certain limitations and certain things that go on. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, really, in my opinion, as long as you have some leverage with a TC and a showing concierge or assistant and you're willing to put in the freaking work, like you're good to go. You know, obviously it's, you're going to ha have to still be working and, and put in the effort, but you know, I kind of like being in the grind, you know, I'm still, I'm, I'm 32. I'm ready to, you know, still work with people. And I just like closing and selling deals. So, um, that's just the way I do it. Yep. No, love it, dude. So then, okay. So when it comes to, cause look, it, it's becoming more and more that I'm having conversations with high producing agents that don't want to go out there and build your traditional team, but they like the concept of the leverage piece, like you're talking about where you maybe have, you know, a showing assistant or two plus the transaction coordinator where they can still be highly involved. Yeah. You know, um, but then there comes that fear of diminished value because you're not out there showing the homes with the relationship. You've got the pass off element. What are some things that you have found to make it where it's coming from a place of value and enhancing the experience versus them feeling like they're being passed off? Setting expectations. That's the number one thing. If you set expectations and foreshadow ahead of time, and this is something I did, I learned from Jason, um, you know, that was one of the most important things because like, yes, if I go and work with a client and then I say all of a sudden they're going to go see a house with my showing concierge and basically never hear or talk from me again, like, of course you're going to be, pa they're going to feel like they're getting passed off. Right. But if I, if I set expectations from the very first time I have a buyer consultation, I say, Hey, you know, this is Stefan Walters. Nice to meet you. 
if we're talking about a property, like I don't, you know, let's say they're just interested in a specific property or we're going over a buyer consultation. I say, Hey, well, you know, just so you know, we'll be available to show you house at any time, because if I'm not available, my showing concierge will be available. You know, and we do this so that we can make sure that we get you into the home as soon as possible. And we have a whole team that's basically going to be helping you out. So if we say that right ahead of time, then they're going to be expecting it. Right. But if we if we never mention or set any expectations with our clients and this goes for everyone, right, setting expectations with your clients, your team members, anyone in life, as long as you're expecting what's going to happen, then you're going to be ready for it. But if you just feel like you're being pawned off because no one set proper expectations or foreshadowed with you, um, then you're definitely going to feel like. Well, you know, am I working with you or does he even care about me? What I do see, though, a lot of people do um, is they do get maybe someone who's a showing assistant or a transaction coordinator, and then they just don't, you can't even get a hold of them, right? Like, you're like, okay, dude, like, well, are you even a part of this deal? Like, you know, or like, let's say a listing agent that's just like non-existent. Yeah. Like, we all, we've all been through those scenarios. Anyone who's in real estate has those scenarios where they try and get a hold of the listing agent, try and get a hold of the buyer's agent, you get their voicemail 24-7. And it's frustrating, right? So even as from an, an agent's point of view, like it's frustrating. You can tell, well, how much, how high quality of a service are they providing to their clients? If I can't even get a hold of them, probably not very good because they think, hey, I'm just going to pass it on. I'm going to not do all the heavy lifting. And then they get used to it to where they're not as involved as they should be. And that's mistake number one, because when that happens, Again, you're, what what's the most important thing, right? Is creating like an unforgettable experience for your clients so that they feel like they, be, this is one from you, they become a, a raving fan, right? And then they want to start telling all their friends and family. And then you have that domino effect of like organic referrals. And that's what, that's what really takes your business to the next level. If you are not creating a memorable experience for them or giving them high quality service, then your business isn't going to grow because they're not going to be super happy. They might not even use you again. So it's all about creating the lifetime value of a client, you know, like knowing the lifetime value of a client, creating that lifetime client and treating them like it and really just treating them how you'd want to be treated. So I know if I was, you know, working with someone and they didn't set any expectations for me and then I did show up and I'm working with just their assistant I'd be like, you know, this kind of sucks, right? Like I, I obviously this dude doesn't give a shit about me. It is what it is. But again, if we say, hey, you know, like we work with X amount of clients, we do this to all to make sure that you're very well taken care of. And then you also have your showing concierge or someone who is really good, you know, someone that's good and personable and feels like you care about them, then that's, you're not going to have an issue. And it's, it's a fear, right? It's just like the fear I had with wanting to, or not wanting to get a TC. The second I got it, look what happened. Boom. Took me to the next level. Okay. I had that same fear. Well, I don't know if I want to get a showing agent. Like this is the other thing, right? There's like sh that, that app called show Ami to where you can like log into it. And someone, some random agent like shows your buyers. That's maybe a little bit sketchy. I don't know if I would do that. Maybe in an emergency situation, if you had no other resorts, but if you have someone again, like on my team who I trust that, like I've set expectations with people like them. So I know they'll, she'll do a good job. Then she goes and shows for me. Well, I'm confident things are going to be okay. And then she can report back to me. I can follow up after and it's all smooth from there. So set expectations with your client ahead of time um, and have the right person showing, you know, you don't want to like, and you have to have high energy. Like when I go, I can be a chameleon with freaking anyone. I don't care who it is. Like I can vibe with pretty much anyone because, you know, I can tell like, well, this person's, you know, like from the labs, they're more of like an engineer mindset. They're not like super outgoing or like high energy like I am. So like I'll tone it down or these people that I meet that are almost exactly like me, I'll bring the energy and we kind of vibe together. So it's all, all about kind of like knowing your client, kind of gauging the situation, feeling them out, and then having someone that you know will go show them as well that will be able to match that energy. So there's a little bit of moving parts to it and you have to kind of work at it. Nothing's going to be perfect, but um, yeah, you just kind of have to take the leap of faith. And also it's just trial and error with anything too, you know? Yep. Yep. Love it. Dude. Okay. So then, man, I mean, we've seen some big shifts in this industry since kind of mid 2022, um, you know, listing volume, cut in half roughly transaction volume cut in half, but still 1.5 plus million realtors. And you yeah. know, what are, what are shifts that you personally made? Cause I mean, you're still doing 95 plus units personally, plus mm -hmm. you have your teammates, you know, I don't think we talked about this in the intro, but plus you're a managing broker of an office. So you have those agents too. 
Yeah. Like what shifts have you personally made and your agents made to go out there and create success in this market? Cause I'll tell you, dude, I mean, I'm having about a half a dozen conversations with agents, team agents, and broker owners on a daily basis, you know, yeah. right now. Um, you know, I started offering free coaching calls and stuff and, and, you know, through the podcast, dude, and I'm saying the average is anywhere between about 40 and 60%. The average agent, team leader, and broker owner's business is down right now versus what they were experiencing pre-2022. Yeah. We're just doing more of it. We're not, we didn't change anything. We're just doing more of what we were doing. Like, you know, I'm biting off. I ha I have a pretty um, hefty tolerance for an appetite for an ad spend. Like, I don't really care as long as I'm making it back and I know like, you know, most people do an ad spend for three months, right? And then they don't see an ROI and they give up, they freak out and they pull out. I will not, I mean, I still kind of like get that sick to my stomach. Like, oh man, these I'm chewed off more ad spend this month. It seems like leads are less quality, like things are still down, but I just keep pushing through. So as long as like when everyone else has seen a shift in like lower, either lower opportunities we're trying to go get more opportunity. So that's really it. It's all about creating opportunity, no matter what that is, whether that is through paid legion or through organic. Um, and I think the most people who are down 40 or 60% were some of those agents who maybe just had luck. You know, I've never had that like luck where just things fall into my lap where I just had like tons of, I've never sold a house to a family member. I mean, my dad's a realtor. He handles that side of the business, you know, my other side's super small. It's just my mom, my stepdad. So it's not like I have cousins and uncles and all this stuff to sell to where I feel like people naturally always get to sell to like friends, family, all this different stuff. I've never relied on my, my close fear to use me. And that's why I went and, you know, created all this other opportunity from nowhere to where now I have just so many people that I've transacted with and they're just strictly from real estate and we've done such a good job and they know I'm, you know, the best here in New Mexico that they continue to come back to me. They refer more people. I continue to push forward, whether that is taking more ad spend, um, we're, you know, collecting as many reviews as possible. I mean, we're just keep going, you know, and I feel like a lot of people who are saying that their business is down, you know, it's, it's, I don't know if you've ever heard that story, right? Well, there's this one guy where he says, he sends his kid off to school to Harvard, right? And he starts like a hot dog stand and all of a sudden, and he's using the super high quality buns, super high quality hot dogs. And like, you know, four years later, his kid comes back from Harvard and he's like, dad, don't you know that we're in a freaking depression? And his dad had grown these hot dog stands, like to 10 different hot dog stands. And he's like, what? We're in a depression. Like, holy shit. Really? Okay. Okay. Well now we need to use cheaper buns. Okay. Now we need to do um, this, we need to, you know, cut costs on this, this, and this. And then all of a sudden he has one freaking hot dog stand less because they've been giving less service. It's like that, that, um, that seed planted of fear and doubt to where everyone else just hears this echo chamber of all oh, the sky's falling. Let's just like pull back. And then when they pull back, they're not going in, in like, again, whether that was because they pulled back on their ad spend, they're not doing more, um, like active lead gen themselves. So I could guarantee you if we actually, you know, pulled back the curtains and looked at what these agents are doing, who are down 40 to 60%, they're just not putting in the work. I mean, that's, it's that simple. I, I know some areas there, you know, interest rates have hurt us for sure. But I, last year I had my biggest year by, you know, 15%, 20%. And that was just because we went as hard as we possibly could. Um, my market's also a little bit different. You know, it's like kind of like an emerging growing market. We have about like, you know, half a million people in all of Albuquerque, but we have, you know, 7,000 active realtors or active licensees. Um, so, but we have people moving in, so we still have a demand, even though interest rates are high, prices are high. Like we haven't taken a dip. Like, I mean, Arizona has maybe pulled back 10, 15% on prices. Maybe I'm not sure we really haven't, but again, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm just trying to buy off as much as I possibly can and move forward. When most people, there's usually a reason for why um, they're not per performing like they were. And it's either because they didn't have people just coming and knocking on their door like they did before. They're not putting in the work. 
Um, and that's just it, man. I, I, I know a lot of people and it's, it's hard as a real estate agent, right? You don't have another boss that's looking over your shoulder, telling you what to do, making sure you're doing your cold calls, doing this. So it's about being honest with yourself. Okay. You're 40% down on your production. Well, what have you been doing to go get more business? Like you need to be working 40% harder than you were in that easy market and guaranteed you're going to be making the same amount, if not more, because if everyone's feeling this and everyone's pulling back, then there's more market share to take over. So, um, and I just keep getting better at my skill, better at my craft, better at negotiating with clients. And like, at this point, again, like I've created the attraction model to where, you know, we provide such a good service and like show that we are true professionals and know that we're what we, you know, know that what we're doing, we actually truly know to where people come to us. And when they talk to us, they feel our energy, they feel the vibe, they actually know that we're legit. So I just think people just need to be true with themselves rather than, you know, say that they're 40 to 60% down. And if you are, have you been putting 40% more effort in since the shift happened, right? Because when shift happens, you know, you just have to either put more effort in or you have to shift, you have to shift with it, right? Like that Gary Keller book, um, I can't remember what it was, but it is, I think it is just called shift. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's plain and, plain and simple. You have to shift with it. And if you're not having the same success and you're doing the exact same things that you were before the shift, well, that's because you didn't pivot. Yep. Yep. Couldn't agree more, dude. And 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 I am, you know, I do get the chance to peel back those onion layers with them. And I mean, everything you said was hitting the nail on the head, dude, right? It's they haven't adapted. They haven't shifted to the new operation style, hedging yep, it with yep. the numbers and, and shifting strategy and um, okay. So then now you mentioned Zillow several times. Um, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm with an alignment with you, dude. Like I love Zillow. You know, I don't have a beef with them. I know a lot of our industry does. Yeah, um, yeah. but you know, we do a lot of business with Zillow. I mean, you gotta know how to work it. You gotta work it right oh, Maybe yeah. it isn't for everybody, but you know, um, if you know how to work it, you can get a massive ROI. Is Zillow oh, your primary lead source? For me, it is. Yeah. You know, for me, um, again, like I told you that I'm with, you know, JMG. So they have for my team members, like we partner with a lot of the biggest B2B referral type networks. So, you know, Rocket Homes, but all these companies are down too. you know, a lot of these big lenders who have referrals to give to the brokerage, they're down 25% too. So, I mean, everyone's seeing it, but for me personally, I have a, a pretty big Zillow ad spend. I'd say I'm at least like the top three to five Zillow ad spend. The reason why is because I was looking to move into the flex program because I know they're about to make that shift. Well, I thought that for like the last three years. So I kept biting off more ad spend. Um, but yeah, we have good luck with it. And again, it's one of those things where it's not like we have a 10 X ROI, but I've met some like invaluable relationships and people that I've been looking to get into certain areas through that um, but you have to be willing to pay the price for a live connection. And that's just with anything, right? Like if you want to do Facebook ads, you have to know it's a two to 6% conversion rate. It's a really low cost per acquisition per lead. You go to Zillow and you're going to be paying, you know, upwards of a thousand dollars a live connection sometimes. But if that's such a high quality, um, type of live connection and you can convert it, it just all has to make sense for you. Right. And for me, it does again with the people that I've met. Um, we convert at like a 32% conversion rate, but I think we've like really nailed down exactly how to hit that initial appointment, go and build rapport, create that relationship and go from there to where, again, it might not work for someone who is either doesn't have a risk appetite for ad spend or they're not comfortable or good at converting. And, and really it takes a lot of time too. Like I was saying before, if you're going to go do something for three months, like y'all know it takes about six months to build the pipeline and maybe start to see some true ROI. Um, it's that instant gratification, but like we have been in it long enough to realize like, Hey, if I, I can chip away at a little bit more ad spend and I know it's not going to give me an instant ROI, but all of a sudden later on it's paying off, paying off. I mean, it makes me sick to my stomach sometimes I see when I see how much we're spending with them, but you know, it's been good for us. So I don't really plan on it changing, with these new rules and how everything's going to change, maybe with these buyers, I don't know. I think they might have to shift with us. And I think that they will hopefully, um, you know, because let's say if things change here in the next three months and we don't even know if we're going to get paid representing a buyer, I mean, our buyer leads going to be as valuable, you know, it's kind of a roll of the dice. So we're going to have to see how it pans out. I personally like them. My whole goal is to become a part of that referral system to where at that point we don't have an ad spend, um, you know, it's the flex program, but you have to be with Zillow for, are you guys in flex? 
Yeah. Yeah. See, so I think it's really invaluable because then you don't have an ad spend, you send out a referral fee, um, and then you have way more of an ad budget for everything else. So it's been a long game for me. Again, I can, I'm looking three to five years out, not what's going to happen right this second. So this has been a plan of mine for the last three to four years, still working towards it. If it doesn't even pan out the way I was expecting it to, we still, you know, had some good ROI, met some really good people. Um, and then again, going back to like the whole lifetime value of a client, I've created some invaluable clients, clientele that, um, I'm going to be working with for another 10 years. Even if I cut my ad spend tomorrow, some of the people that I've worked with, it's going to pay multiple X ROI because I'll retransact with them or get referrals from them. Um, and that's, you know, that's, that's the name of the game, right? Trying to stay in this business as long as possible to get referrals from people and then not just be so short-sighted to say, oh, I'm paying X amount in, on ad spend right now. I'm only going to get this ROI this year. Well, what is it going to be, you know, years from now? So. Yeah. Yeah. I hope everyone watching and listening is really picking up on that. Of, of Look, every, every great operator understands the power and the importance of LTV. Lifetime value mm -hmm. of a customer, you know, and, and yep. this is something like, okay, like if you think of like Zillow flex, right? So like mm -hmm. Zillow could take anywhere between 35 to 40% off the top. Yep. So then, okay, then we're splitting at 50, 50. So some agents, when they come look at joining the team, will be like, well, dude, I'm only making a third of the commission, yeah. you know, but it's like, look, you can never, you got to look at this, of this, this commission, this deal isn't worth three or five grand to you. If you play mm -hmm. the game, right, this customer's worth a hundred grand to you through yep. all the repeat referral business that you get. And the right people understand the power of the LTV. You know, small minds can't really capture that. But you're, you're, you know, because again, all that repeat referral business, it's just that one transaction that maybe you're not getting a massive ROI on. But mm -hmm. I got to imagine at 32% conversion due, which I want to break down here in a minute, because that's freaking insane. If you look at most Zillow teams, they're in, you know, in that 10 to 15% conversion range. Mm -hmm. And, and um, you know, but again, that LTV, dude, it just keeps adding, adding, adding. So with that, to get a 32% conversion rate on Zillow, because I, I got to say, dude, that's got to be the best numbers I think I've ever heard of anybody. Um, what are you guys doing different with your process? Or what are you currently doing to to hit? Can you just walk? I know there's probably a lot, yeah. like hours breaking down every element of this, but we we're kind of break down your, your kind of framework of your overall process to hit those kind of conversions. What does that look like? Yeah, so... You know, and it's not every single month, right? Like it varies, but like for, there's been times where one of the more recent times where, you know, my, my, my rep is showing me, Hey man, you're like the number one converter in the state right now at a 32% conversion rate. I don't know if that's with the other flex teams. Cause there's three flex teams here, but there's been times again, where we hit that 32% conversion rate and we're pretty consistent right around that 30. So this also I think plays a big role into it. What is the best seller lead, right? A buyer lead, in my opinion, because typically if you have a buyer, if you have, if you're looking to have someone uh, or find someone that needs to sell a house, what do you need to really find like motive and what typically is their motive? Another house. So if you find these people who come in as a live call and they're a buyer lead and then they need to go and you know, buy a home, but they have one to sell. Well, there's two deals right there. So I think that might play into the conversion a little bit more, you know, and I've gotten really lucky with just the people that, you know, needed to, this didn't happen for a while too. Like only for like the last two years, I'm like, damn, I'm getting freaking dominoes, like two, you know, like a, a buy and a sell because that's just how it worked. So, um, and again, I've seen people double end plenty of stuff or have those buy and sells throughout my career. And I'm like, well, I never have. I've sold 150 homes, 200 homes, whatever at the time years back. And I'm never double ending. I'm never finding someone that needs to buy or sell. So it could all be timing too. Um, but I think that could play into it, right? Finding the people who also need to sell their home and buy a home because that just, you know, it, it, it calculates for however Zillow calculates your conversion ratio. Um, and then two, I think it's just how we do it, man. I mean, like me and, and, um, my partner Tess, who my girlfriend Tess, who's my business partner as well. We have been the ones that are like mainly working like the Zillow leads. Um, but my agents convert them crazy too, whenever they get them. So, you know, we just make sure that we really build rapport. 
we make sure that we get them in the house right away because it's like, a, um, I can't remember the exact statistics, but let's say if they call and we don't meet them at that appointment, like it's a very, very less significant chance of us converting them. So meeting them in person first, right off the bat, treating them like a freaking individual, you know, and just creating that relationship. Cause I feel like a lot of the other times, like people just forget that, you know, we're all humans, you know, we're meeting someone to go sell them a house, not just like, you know, a lead. So we don't walk in there. Hey, here's this three bedroom, two bath. You like it? You want to buy it? No, you know, we're walking in there just to create the relationship because chances are, we're not even going to sell them that open uh, that house. Right. So going in there, creating a relationship and then following up like, you know, exactly how we should putting them on a home search right away. Um, I think also again, Zillow works really well in my market. So it could be different in other markets that have a little bit more saturation, but creating rapport, building that relationship, getting them on a search right away, and then following up, you know, it's the funny thing is, is everyone tries to overcomplicate it. They're like, do you have a drip system? Do you have this? I'm like, no, dude, I freaking dial in their search for them. I know what they're looking for. If I see it come up, I'm the first one to send it to them and we stay on top of them. And then again, creating that relationship to where they want to, you know, come back and, and reach out to me if they see something else. And that's also something that I feel like, you know, a lot of people need to learn, including myself. It took me a while, you know, I'm like, well, why don't these people, why aren't they just calling me? Like they ended up buying a house or someone else. Like, why the hell didn't they call me? Well, first off, they have a million other options. Second off, was I their best option? Now I for sure am because I just feel confident enough in my craft to where when I meet someone, not only am I more like sociable, I feel like sometimes with people, but I like know my shit, you know? So becoming a true expert in real estate and knowing, you know, the process from front to back, knowing exactly what inspection you need to do, knowing the market, knowing the locations, like just knowing being an actual expert and a true professional, people can see that, you know, you can't fake it. You, when you, when I meet someone, like if I meet an accountant or someone like I, that is something I still am having a really hard time finding, you know, when I go meet an accountant and I'm like asking them questions that I think that they should know about certain strategies. And then they're sitting here with an answer like, oh, I don't know. Or I don't think you can do that. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure you can do that. Can you look into it? They look into it, get back to me. Oh, you were right. You can't. Oh, really? I'm telling you how to be an accountant. I don't trust them. You know, I automatically, their credibility goes to zero. But if they, if I can meet a client and I have an answer for every single question that they possibly have, like you have to impress your people. So that's the other thing too, is like truly knowing your stuff, being a true professional and also being presentable too, right? Like whenever we go, we're looking clean, like our cars look great. Um, you, you just have to be well-rounded. So I think it's just, everything in one. And then also the follow-up. Most people just show a house and then they may never reach out to them again. You know, they maybe never send them something or they are like, Oh shit, I got to hit this person back up in a month. And then they do. And they're like, who are you again? But if you send follow-up texts, if you're constantly sending properties after it's that initial creation of the relationship to where it's going to really kick it off to the best conversion possible. Um, rather than, cause you know, you guys, I'm sure you, you, you've dealt with this. You've seen your team members deal with it. You have agents that come on here that deal with it. You meet someone and you're like, that was a good lead. Right. And then all of a sudden you might put them in your CRM or maybe you're thinking about them three weeks later and you're like, Oh shit, I need to send that person a home or put their home search on. And then you do it. And then they're like, Oh, sorry, I already working with someone else. Or I just went to that open house and bought it. It's all speed to lead. It's all like showing that you're going to provide value right up front, right away. And just kind of being on top of them. And you're going to know which ones are going to convert or not. You know, I mean, some, not every person is for everyone. Like I'm going to meet some people that like don't vibe with me. And if they don't want to work with me, then I can tell. And it's like, all right, well, you know, I'm not going to like give my, a thousand percent effort and chase them down. But the people that I think I created a good, um, you know, I kind of created that first initial relationship with, I know that they need some help and I'm not too pushy. Then they'll, you know, but it's that, that fine line, like it, it works well. So it's just trial and error too, right? Like, it's not like this, it's not like we just did Zillow leads two days ago and all of a sudden we're freaking crushing it. This took years. And and the other thing is too, so let's say if you do get a Zillow lead or anyone that's had, that's like an inbound lead and they have, and it's on a specific property they want to check out, if they want to see it today at five and you don't want to show it until tomorrow at six, well, you're probably not going to necessarily convert it. So 
we're willing to do whatever it takes. Like, okay, you want to see this house at five o'clock? It's 12 o'clock on a Saturday. Like shit, dude. Okay. I'll go show it to you. Boom. Build that rapport. And it's always the ones that we maybe necessarily didn't want to do. Right. You know, it's freaking Easter or something. It comes in. I'm like, are you freaking kidding me, dude? Do you want to see a home at three o'clock today? And it's, you know, nine o'clock in the morning we go show them. We're like, Hey, that was a good person to meet. So we live, breathe, eat in real estate. Like this is what we do. You know, we don't like shy away from it. We've created it as our lifestyle. And then I think the people can see, Hey, they have created this as their lifestyle. It's not just like their side gig or not this, like, and it's all about the energy you put into it. So if you go into it with a shitty attitude, like these don't convert that well, you know, or they sometimes do, we go into it. Like I'm going to convert every freaking one. And if it's not good, it's not. And if it is good, then it is. So it's about the energy you put into it, trial and error to see what works for you and actually giving it that time. To, I mean, we've been doing this for four and a half years now, you know? So, um, and the other thing is too, is our conversion rates high because again, I'm not like any of my new agents that come on, I'm not trying to pass them Zillow leads or pass everyone leads around because when you do that, it kind of gets scattered. Like, you know, who's, who's trying to take care of who, you know, we're really focused on whoever's getting these opportunities. You need to, you need to make sure that you're converting them. You're going to go into perfect storm. I use perfect storm. So you, I'm going to assign it to you. You're going to go log calls. You're going to update in the app. You're going to like, make sure that this person converts at least give you the best possible opportunity to do so. Um, so again, it's cr treating like uh, creating or treating it like a business rather than just like, you know, hopefully it converts. Um, and I think we're a little bit more hardcore than most, but I don't know. I just like, I like winning. I like freaking converting. I like selling people homes. I like creating good relationships. So again, it's more of a lifestyle for me than, than it is anything else, you know? And that's why I think, you know, I'm the youngest Okay. So like, let's say top five teams, you know, some of these teams here, I've been doing it for 20 years, 25 years, and I'm the youngest by 10, 15 years, but I like doing it. Like, this is like my, I've always been good at whatever I do because I always give my all at it. Right. So when I'm growing up and I'm, I'm a competitive skateboarder, like that's all I wanted to do freaking all the time, all at it, whatever it is, you know, lifting weights, bodybuilding, like I'm all in whatever I want to do at that time. And right now it just happens to be real estate and actually now trying to coach people and like lead, like basically create more success stories rather than just that failure rate. But you have to be the right person for it and you have to be coachable as well. And if you, you know, it's, it's not for everyone. So if you're not willing to grind and do all the shit, you may not have the success you're looking for. And you have to be honest with yourself of that too, you know? Yep. Yep. hundred percent, man. I dude, It's uh, yeah, it's got me safe when I'm recruiting a new agent. You know, um, or or they're talking to me about an opportunity within our team. You know, it's number one com first conversation I have with them is, dude, this isn't a job. This is a lifestyle. Like, and you yeah. got to be prepared, you know, because like yep. you, you talked about the failure rate and it's like, look, if they're not fully committed, if they're not chips all in, like, I'm not going to take them on, you know, yeah. right? um, you know, but for those that are truly committed, like yourself, dude, like, I don't know another vehicle that you can go from zero to hero in and the fast speed of time like you can in real estate that can be such a life changer. Yeah. As a vehicle that we're all blessed to be a part of. For sure, man. I mean, and that's the thing. And it's, it's hard because sometimes people think they want it, but they don't realize what it takes to do it. So even when you are recruiting, like everyone's like the yes person and, oh, I understand that. And I'm going to do whatever it takes. They see a little bit of it and then it just doesn't, you know, it's not exactly what they were expecting. So again, it's all by setting expectations and foreshadowing. I mean, like, hey, dude, this isn't going to be easy. The funny thing is, is when I try and set expectations with people who reach out to me about joining real estate or want to join the team, I think they think that I'm trying to talk them out of being a realtor. They're like, oh, he's probably just trying to keep all this business for himself. You know, he doesn't want to, he doesn't want us to join. I'm like, no, dude, I want, I want to paint the picture as clear as possible for you so that you know what you're getting into rather than waste your money, time and effort to get into real estate and say that sucked. Cause how many people do you know, or come across, oh, I used to have my real estate license. Everyone, everyone used to have their real estate license and everyone has an opinion on how it works. And it's like, oh, well, if you're so good at like, you know, if you have so much advice and opinions on this matter, when we're, you know. And, and this is just like a friend. Oh, my friend used to have their real estate license and he was telling me about this. Oh, is he practicing real estate anymore? No. Okay, well, why does he have such an opinion on this? They they probably aren't as skilled as they 
as they think they are. And that's why they quit because it's harder than it is. So like, let's listen to the true professionals right here, because again, everyone knows someone that did have their license at one point. And the reason why they don't anymore is because it was a lot more than they were expecting, you know? Yep. Yep. hundred percent. dudes. Okay. So then a lot going on right now with these, you know, this NAR lawsuit settlement. And I know and understand it's kind of tough because there's so much vagueness inside there, you know, but they've given yeah. us some clarity, right? Um, you know, what, what, if anything, are you doing internally to go out there and prep for these changes that are, I know, I know they were originally in July. Now they're pushed back to August, but like, what are you doing to go out there and ensure that you and your agents are most prepped? So that's, you know, that's a good question. A little bit of a loaded question too. Cause like you're saying, we don't know which route it's going to go like, and so preparing for you almost have to have two options like how we're going to go about it and i really don't want to like go full force creating these options because you know i actually kind of put together a whole back end thing with what we're going to do to present to our buyers to, to you know basically phrase it in a way of how we're going to re you know require them or you know to basically pay for our services right but i don't know exactly how i'm going to go about that until we know which route that is because I feel like they're going to have to be a little bit different. Um, so, you know, I don't want to speak on that too much right now because again, I do have a solution for one, for the first one, but if the DOJ wants to truly decouple real estate commissions from a seller being allowed to pay a buyer's agent commission, then we're going to handle it a little bit differently. Uh, I think actually probably a lot differently. And I think it's going to be a whole different ball game. So I don't, you know, I, I'm just going to have to see how it all pans out. Cause who knows, they might throw another change at us. Probably not. Right. But I feel like all of a sudden, you know, this year has been a, a handful of changes. Um, you know, and I don't like to really focus about on that stuff until we know exactly what's going to happen and then we can do it. You know, obviously we want to be as prepared as possible, which I thought we were getting until I really realized, Hey, there's still two paths we're going to go down right now. And they're going to be significantly different if the seller is not even allowed to pay the buyer's agent's commission. Um, which I think is just interrupting a complete a free market in general. Like how how is this even legal? I I, I don't know. I mean, it's it's still a little bit mind blowing. And I also think that you know, like you were saying, this isn't about you know trying to protect any consumer. This is going to make it harder for the consumer. This is going to make it harder to you know for new home buyers or any home buyers to really create home ownership for a first time. Um, this is you know not getting into conspiracy theory stuff, but this is, you know, this is going a little bit deeper down the rabbit hole. Um, so I'm just going to have to see how it plays out and then kind of take it from there. But we do have a couple options. I just really want to see which route it's going to be. And I really, just like your video, you had that one video, if you want to even link it in this one, um, cause that was an amazing video. It was like 40 minutes of just jam packed knowledge. And I think also it's making it clear to everyone that there are two paths, right? That one where, there, you know, we might not be able to see what the seller is offering for compensation, but they're still allowed to pay for it. Or the DOJ wants to decouple it completely to where the buyer's agent has to pay their own sellers or the seller has to pay their own seller's agent. And it's going to be two different outcomes for sure. Yeah. Hopefully it's the first. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with you. I think that's, you know, best case scenario. And hopefully that's the way it plays out. But I mean, the cool part is, is it's not like there's not other countries that are operating you know, in that manner. So it's yeah. like, okay, you know, like either way, you know, guys like you and I, and, and those watching us in this podcast that are truly committed to creating success in this industry. It's like, oh, you know, I, I have so many freaking out about this. And I'm like, all right, dude, like I got coaching clients in New Zealand as an example. They're still out there murdering, it, kicking ass, crushing it, making a shit yeah. ton of money, you know? Um, so they've already been doing it like that for a while. Yeah. Yeah. Like they're like, wow. okay, it's like, dude, it's, so I coach a, a successful broker owner down there and internally, dude, there, there's no such thing as, oh, let's go generate buyer leads and, and how are we going to go rep buyers? You know, right. Cause like there is, I mean, there's technically buyer agency, but in practice, it doesn't exist. Yeah. You know, as a realtor, like you go get listings, buyers come direct to you, dual site every deal, mm -hmm. you know, and, and if they are going to have an element of representation, it's through attorneys, you yeah. know, um, um, cause they have true decoupling, you know, uh, uh there, but there's still, massively successful realtors, team leaders, and broker owners making seven, eight plus figures yearly. Yeah. You know, and it, there's always going to be opportunity because the thing that doesn't change is look, there's still 340 million Americans. There's over, you know, hundred million, you know, residences, you know, throughout the, United. I mean, trans it's like, people are still going to need homes. People are still going to transact in real estate. You know, there's mm -hmm. always going to be opportunity, you know? So, yeah. you know, 
and then you've heard me preach this a million times, but it's just like, don't operate from a place of fear. Just have awareness, pay attention and pivot and adapt accordingly. And you'll be good to go. Well, that being said, I mean, then really it's kind of what you talk about is just really nailing down listings. And, and again, that's why I'm trying not to just make my team handicapped and not be able to do listings. I want to make sure that they're well-rounded so that they can do whatever they want, be, feel comfortable being on the team as long as they want, because it's not like I'm forcing them to, you know, basically pass their listings to us. And then when this happens, if, if it shakes things up with buyer's agents, well, they can still go do listings. Um, that is the scary part though, a little bit, right? I mean, if we're cutting out, I mean, at least 50% of our business has been working from buyers. And I, if buyers agents are going to have, or buyers are going to have to pay buyers agents commission. Well, I mean, we're going to try and uh, try and get them to pay a full, whatever percent that we charge as a company, but will that result in a little bit of a haircut? It might, we'll see, you know, it depends because it, there's, we still have competitive homes right now. So if we're going up against five, six offers, I mean, you know, we got to be as competitive as possible. And that also means the buyer has to be as capable as possible. So I don't know. Yeah. It's definitely going to be better to be a listing agent right now. And that's why I'm like, my whole career, right, like is has been based around how can I like become the best agent I possibly can and not just knowing the transaction, but like giving me the best opportunity to convert. And that means like when I go into a listing appointment, I want to know every single kind of like objection that I can come across to where I have something to say and I my presentations on all dialed in to where I can convert as much opportunity as possible because you know. The idea is to have unlimited opportunity as much coming in, but if you kind of if you're a really good converter, then that's how you're gonna get as much business. And so, if agents can just kind of be be the good agent and like really hone in on their skill, and that's not just knowing the transaction and knowing what inspections to get, like how to talk with your buyer, like tonality, body language, like what to say in certain situations. And that's what I can do with listings to where I feel more confident to where, and that's what it is too, is like confidence. Like if you know what you're talking about, this goes with anything. If you know, if you know what you're talking about and you feel prepared, you're going to be confident and it's going to radiate from you. If you don't know how to, you know, what you're really doing in a listing or what to talk about or what to say, if you go into a listing appointment, they're going to be like, you know, they're going to see it on you. So I have prepped myself and as all my team as much as possible and basically whoever I coach to be as prepared to when you walk into a listing or you meet a buyer, you're just radiating confidence because you know your shit and then you can convert better and you're going to be converting better than all the other agents out there. And so again, if we're getting real competitive on listings, you have to A, create the, the as much opportunity for listings as you possibly can, but B, be prepared so that when you walk in, you're confident and you can actually convert it rather than, you know, it's always, you're never going to get them all. You're, you're going to convert like you know, 60 to 70 to 80% on the high end of all of your listings as a listing agent, right? You're not going to convert them all. But if you're prepared as much as you possibly can, you're giving yourself the best chance to convert more, which is going to, you know, be help you with opportunity costs. Like you're not out there wasting time on listing appointments and certain things like that. So just becoming a better well-rounded agent, especially on the listing side, which is exactly what I've dialed in, and now if we're going to be really focused on listings while well, I'm ready. So being ready in this change is going to be the most crucial thing for sure. You know? Yeah. It's like my, my coach always says, man, you always got to be preparing to be prepared. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> um, all right, man. So just, uh, I know we're going long on time. So just a few last questions here for yeah. you. Um, all right, dude. So, I mean, you've been at this, you know, what, eight years now, roughly, um, mm -hmm. you know, built this amazingly highly profitable, successful business. What, what do you, what do you see this going, man? Well, I mean, what's, what's your long-term vision for, for your team, for your business? What, like, where do you see this in now, 10, 20 more years? Great question. I mean, again, the reason why I named it, you know, New Mexico home group, my team and kind of had like a hyper local logo is because I wanted it to be something everyone else can get behind. Right. You know, like I, there's only a limited amount of people that can get behind Stefan Walters real estate. Um, you know, and I know plenty of people name their, bro their teams or whatever around their name. That's totally fine. I just kind of had a different vision to where I really wanted it to be more hyper local to where I could kind of grow this thing and, and just work on teaching and training other people who knows where real estate in general is going to be in 20 years. Right. But at least for now, I want to build it to where I can, you know, get the right people in with us 
teach them and train them, set them up for the best possible success that they can. Um, and just keep riding this ride, man. Cause it is a freaking roller coaster. I mean, it's real estate. So, um, yeah, just keep going as long as we possibly can. And I, it's not like it's something I'm trying to build up something to sell or anything, you know, I mean, this is just, I didn't even think you'd get this big. Who the hell knew? You know, I don't know. I don't, you know, we're just trying to keep stacking the blocks and see where it goes. But I think really one of the things that I'm real passionate about is coaching, you know, um, even just be getting coached by you, you're my first coach. Jason Mitchell was like my second. I've had like little other smaller kind of coaching programs within there, but like, you know, you guys have had like the most effect on me so far. And I think mentorship is crucial for anyone's success. So I'm passionate about like, I, I loved working a deal, right. And helping people, but like, I'm truly passionate about like coaching other people because I feel like I've learned a lot at this point and I have a lot of value to provide. And I see a lot of people either failing or making mistakes that they could easily change by even just changing some of their daily habits to kind of create the person that they want to be. Um, but specifically in real estate, you know, like there's little tweaks and little tips that if I had long earlier in the game, I could have had success probably a lot quicker. And I'm would, I want to cut the learning curve for realtors by like a landslide, at least the people who are, who want to team up and join on my team and stuff. So, you know, that's at least what I see it right now for the short term, you know, continuing building the team with like-minded people. I'm not trying to build a mega team. I want people who are actually going to stay for the long term, especially if I'm trying to like pour my heart and soul with my coaching to them. You know, I'm not trying to like train some people so that they can leave in a year or two um, after I just freaking gave them all my, you know, eight years condensed into like one or two. But I just want people to like, you know, I want to help people set themselves up for success because, you know, when we're grown up, right, we don't really know what we're going to do. We think grown ups have it all figured out. You know, I'm 32 and I'm still, we're all trying to figure shit out. We're all, all of every grown up's always trying to figure it out. No one has it figured out. Some may think they do or they show, they make it seem like they do. But as long as we're constantly learning and growing, you know, that's the most important thing. And the way that I've been able to do that is for, as from coaching programs, mentorship and stuff like that. So to really make an impact on the world and like, or at least my little world, I think that's the, the thing that I'm really looking to do the most is you know, help people and make that small impact on individuals to really achieve some levels of success that they didn't even really realize that they were capable of. Yep. Oh yeah, man. All right. So one last question for you, but before I jump into that, dude, just for anybody that's watching and listening to this, you know, I mean, we're all in the real estate industry here, so maybe they have a referral for your market there in New Mexico. Yeah. Um, you know, or do they just want to follow you on this success journey, dude? Or if they're in your area, they want to talk to you about joining your amazing team. Like, where's the best place to, to get in touch with the issue referral to follow you? Oh, uh, yeah. So, I mean, if you'd even just search my name, Stefan Walters with two S's at the very end on Instagram, that's an easy place. Um, I mean, if you even just Google my name, like that's again, talking about building a personal brand. Like that's one thing that like, if you search my name, there's pretty much not a whole lot of other, like that's going to pop up, really populate like a whole other bunch of Stefan Walters. And again, I'm doing this by design, right? Like I'm creating my brand to where, you know, let's say if someone does meet me and they want to look me up online, like, is this guy even, what is he talking about? Is he, is he even a good realtor, you know, like clients, individual clients. And then they look me up and I have, you know, 200 plus reviews and 300 on Zillow and whatever else. They're like, oh, okay, this guy isn't just bullshitting. Right. So that's the cool thing is we can kind of paint the picture of who we want to be online with social proof and credibility. So, I mean, you can even just do a simple Google search, but I do, I'm real active on Instagram or Facebook. So even if you Google me, those two will pop up pretty quickly. Um, and I'm kind of doing a little bit more long form content. Just again, search YouTube, Stefan Walters, my name. I'm sure you'll drop my how you spell it. Um, I'm pretty easy to find for sure. So yeah, just follow me on Instagram. That's probably the place I'm most active on. And I'll always message you back too. Oh man, love it. So last question, dude. All right, so Stefan today could go back or could sit on a park bench with your, you know, earlier version of yourself eight years ago when you first started this journey, but knowing everything now, you know, now today, like the current version of yourself, having a conversation with the younger version of yourself and give yourself a couple pieces of advice that you just wish you would have known that would have fast forward the success trajectory. What would those couple pieces of advice look like? 
um, pr probably take more risks, you know, take a little calculated risks, right? So take calculated risks, trust your gut and kind of your feeling right off the bat rather than, you know, cause a lot of people, I feel like they, they, they talk to other people about their goals or what they want to do. And then other people maybe not have that same vision. So then they start like, well, I don't know, man, I don't know if you should do that. And then it plants seeds of doubt in your mind. And then you're like, oh shit, you know, you have start having that, that fear and doubt. So if you want to do something, go freaking do it. Right. And invest in yourself. You know, like I have a, another video that I put out a while back, like just a short video. It's like, what is the best thing that you can invest in? That's going to pay you like the biggest ROI, right? That's completely market proof to where if the market crashes tomorrow, I don't care if that's stocks, real estate, crypto, what can you invest in today that's going to pay dividends over time? And that's yourself, personal investment. If you if you buy that program that you wanted, you buy that course, you buy that mentorship, whatever, because some of those are like the most life-changing experiences that you can have that really like take you to the next level. And a lot of the times, you know, like, well, I, I wish I could have free coaching, right? Well, if you don't pay for it, sometimes you have to pay to play. Because if you don't pay, sometimes you're not paying attention. You're like, well, it's free. I'll get back to that later on, whatever. So you have to have like an actual monetary, um, like put some money on the line and actually invest some money. And then you're going to probably pay more attention. So taking risks on yourself and investing in yourself. Because again, like what have I been really talking about this whole time is like becoming the person that you need to be to achieve that level of success. You know, I always, when I first got into real estate, I'm like, dude, everyone should come freaking buy houses from me. Why the hell am I not selling more homes? Why am I not having the success I like? Because I didn't create the person that was ready for it yet. And so if you invest in yourself and you learn a skill, you can, and no one can ever come take that skill from you, right? You can go invest in a stock tomorrow and that stock goes down to nothing. And it's like, oh, well, that sucks, you know? Or even if the market did crash, which I don't think the market can even crash. I mean, with such freaking demand, let's say house is dumped by 50%. Like, well, you lost some equity. Put that money into yourself and you're going to always have that like skill that you learned. You know, you have to be, you have to do your research about it, right? Like, don't just trust everyone for what they say, verify and like, make sure that like, you know, if you do go into a coaching program or a mentorship program, like you have a million testimonials, you can look up how successful you've been and you can say, okay, well, this dude has like done what I want to do. I'm willing to like invest in myself by buying one of your programs and taking that leap of faith. And then, you know, what would I have done if I never even took your, your course? I don't know, but I felt a level of commitment at that I, you know, bought the program. I said, here's the shit that I need to do that I'm learning, go implement it. And it's all about the mindset too, right? Like, I think that's the whole thing too. You have to have like a different mindset about it. You can't just like, like what, what is the first part we even start with in your, in your course? Like, I can't really remember exactly, but it's like building like a mindset, right? So like the first thing that I'm trying to train people is like build an unbreakable mindset on how you're going to go out there and achieve whatever level of success that you want by basically, again, creating that unbreakable mindset and being able to do whatever it takes. So invest in yourself, realize that you have to become the person that like can achieve that success because any level of success, you're going to basically like achieve the level of success that you're ready for. You know, no one's going out there and selling a hundred homes a year and they don't have the skill to do so. So you have to become that person first, doing that by investing in yourself, learning, reading, being really disciplined, um, and just believing in yourself. You know, I have a quote over there. Like I made a video for my team like that. I haven't even put it out yet, but like the main point of it is you are enough. You know, you have to know, tell yourself like, Hey, I am enough. Cause a lot of this stuff, we have like a self-limiting beliefs where we're like, well, I don't know. I'm not as good as that guy. Or I might not like be as tall as that dude. And he's cooler or whatever. So that's why he has a level of success. It's like, we have this like mind mental prison of self-limiting beliefs to where we just don't think that we can do certain things. And then that itself creates the fear and not letting us achieve that, you know, the level of success that we want to. But if we say, Hey dude, I can freaking do anything. Like I'm obviously not there yet, but if I work towards it, I can do whatever I want. So realizing that you are enough, you need to invest in yourself. You need to take that risk and, you know, we only have one freaking life to live. You know, you don't want to live it all cramped up in a 
you know, all cooped up and afraid to do things, you know, just take those risks and go for it. And sorry, that's probably a lot longer. Every single time you ask me a question, I went a lot longer. Um, but, <laughs> I love it, dude. No, it's, it's all right. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, you're, you're delivering so much value, man. Such powerful stuff. And and man, I know how busy you are. And the fact that you came on here, taking time out of your busy day, share all this information with us, man, has been, it's been amazing. And it's been an honor, brother. No, I appreciate you, my man. I mean, like I said, you're my first coach. I mean, pretty much in general, real estate coach. First, I mean, boot camp number 20. I don't even know if you're still doing the boot camp. So I know you kind of shifted it a little bit, but um, you know, I've been following you forever. So to be on your on your podcast is an honor. And I really appreciate you, my man. I really do. Yep, 100 percent You as well, my friend. And those watching and listening, as always, we truly appreciate you guys being here. Truly appreciate your support. Keep crushing it, keep kicking ass, and we'll see you next time. Peace. <laughs>